Welcome back, everyone. It's Trek Yards time yet again, and it's also a special guest episode today. But to start off things, as we always do, I am Captain Foley. I'm Connell Cockinson. Yes, you heard right. Stuart's right. It's time for another special guest to join us and talk about incredible ship design, or should I say modified design? That's right. We have with us the very talented Eric Henry joining us again today. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Good to be back. And today we'll be taking a look at your one of your newer kind of reimaginings of an older ship, Doug Drexler's classic NX-01 design, but your take on it for your Pacific 201 productions. So let's get into it. Yeah, in, in, indeed. An old classic given the 2016 treatment, as it were. Which kind of brings me to the first question. So re re refresh us. When is the actual time period of Pacific 201? How old is the NX-01 at the point where your story takes place? Um, and when was she refitted to then see her in the stars? Quite a lot to ask straight away, but let's set the context of your of your story. Yeah, well, Pacific 201 is virtually 2200, so it's mm. roughly halfway between Enterprise and the original series. So I guess the NX-01 would be like close to 50 years old, or yeah, a little less than 50 years old, I guess, by that point. Okay, so like we know that there's like Doug Drexler's refit um, NX class, and that's kind of a non-issue here. The way I imagine it is kind of how real ships are built, where almost every ship of a class is not identical to the one before it. Like there's kind of an elasticity mm -hmm. to ship classes in real mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. what the the one I imagine for Pacific 201, I kind of tentatively call it the NX07. And the idea was that it was built the way that you see it. Um, mm -hmm. And like the 06 would look a little bit different than the, than the one like, so, cause you know, uh, NX02 Columbia is slightly different than NX01. It's got a different dish. It's got a different hole material. Um, it's at least treated differently. The, you know, it's silver instead of copper. So I'm imagining NX03 would look a little different than those. And the four would mm -hmm. like these little tweaks that when you eventually get to the 07, which I imagine is the last NX class ship that was ever built. It's like, hmm. you know, it doesn't look much different than perhaps the 06, but it looked very different from the 01 in cer certain ways. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is it's the iPhone of the NX world. It's <laughs> iterative on the same design, just keeps changing a bit, but it's still roughly the same it's thing. Still on the same design, but it's yeah, it's got its own idiosyncrasies. That's pretty cool. So. Talk to us about your decision to actually use the NX style of ship in your production. Um, why not a new Explorer class of ship? Is she still pretty much the primary uh, ship for your era? Something that bugged me about the final episode of Enterprise was that they were already decommissioning the, the Ten Enterprise. Years. Like, Ten that years. That ship is incredibly young for any sort of like remotely military style hardware. In the real world, going back again, like we reuse that stuff for a long time. Um, like we were using World War II battleships and decades later in the, in the 70s and the 80s even. It's strange to me that it was being decommissioned so soon. So the NX class in, in the context of Pacific 201 is kind of an ancient ship, but like it still has its uses. So when we see the NX class, it is not a ship of the line so much as it's still useful. So we didn't get rid of them all. We're, they've got, it is kind of like an old clunker when we see it in Pacific 201. It's not like, if you got command of an NX class, you wouldn't like complain, but it'd be like, mm, you know, it's an old ship. My idea is that the NX classes were kind of uh, repurposed during the, like, they were built, the original NX design was built for, as like a long range explorer craft, mm. but I had in mind that the NX class would be like a really rare sort of vessel during the war. Like it was not a mainline combat vessel. What they did with the NX classes was repurpose them into mobile bases that had like hospital mm. facilities, administrative facilities. So you wouldn't see an NX class leading the charge against the Romulans. An mm. NX class would be like a regional, like local base where like supplies would come in and like you would regroup around an NX class. So like maybe you would have like an NX class with like two warships docked with it. And like, you know, like it's. So the, the dreadnought of the, like how the, how they use dreadnoughts in the TOS era that is like a fleet command ship. Yeah, definitely. And like a lot of the crew quarters would be like repurposed into extra mm -hmm. hospital facilities. And everything would just be like a, like a hub, you know? And then after the war, you, you kind of re retrofit the ships again. The NS classes would be relatively safe during the war. I mean, the, I'm sure there would be a, a, 
high profile target for the Romulans though, mm. but they would also be highly defended. Mm -hmm. So well, this ship obviously looks and feels more advanced, uh, a much closer step to the TOS hull plating that we know from the drill series. Talk us through this actual design that you've done. What did you want to achieve and what do you change? When I knew I wanted to do an NX class, um, I contacted Tommy Craft, um, you know, of Horizon. And I, and we, we talked and I was like, hey, um, could you lend me your uh, NX class model? Because it's probably the, well, besides the production version, it's the best one available. Um, so I used Tommy Craft's NX class as a base and basically remodeled everything uh, from scratch. The only thing that remains is the forward half of the catamaran hulls because they were perfect and I didn't mess with those. Everything else I remodeled. And um, my idea was just to straight to smooth out everything. Um, the NX class has so many like folds and dimples and just curves. It has the, the lines of a jet aircraft that you have a lot of this internal machinery that cannot stick out at supersonic speeds or whatever, or near mm. near sonic speeds. So everything like is covered over. If the hull just covers the, the, the equipment perfectly and you're cutting off weight and trying to keep it aerodynamic, that works, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it does not fit the original series aesthetic mm. whatsoever, yeah. in my yeah. opinion, which has very gentle lines and curves. Um, no really sharp turns anywhere so like the catamaran hulls i smoothed them out um i wanted to make everything as straight as possible so i took the bend out of the nacelle pylons mm -hmm. i took as many notches out of the primary hull as i could uh remove the impulse engines from the saucer i smoothed over the deflector notch now speaking of impulse engines this one has beefed up impulse engines so i would assume that's just an upgrade in tech um you know more advanced more powerful engines they're taller um and mm -hmm. I, th I don't think they're quite as wide though but the idea was that mm -hmm. the designers at starfleet thought well we don't really need these forward impulse engines um because apparently the ship does not separate from its catamaran holes in any way so um they took them off the saucer and just kind of well, let's just bulk up the rear impulse engines and, mm. you know, call it even. You've lost the, the front facades, you've lost the, the aft uh, end caps, you've got a sort of glowing element, and you've really elongated these nacelles. I mean, I've, you've got mm. literally side by sides, and it is dramatically different. Um, talk us through why such a radical change. Warp engines are a extremely critical target in battle. Mm. So the later NX ships, which were perhaps like when the war hit, they like pumped these mm. ships out. Firstly, they didn't have the resources to make really sophisticated warp engines for war era craft. And secondly, they didn't have the liberty to make them perhaps as vulnerable as would make them more practical for warp drive with like mm. the exposed coils and the exposed Bussard collectors which are liberties for peacetime, in my opinion. So when you see all those glowing elements on the ship, those would be targets. Better, <laughs> they would be they're better targets when they're glowing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you can't see them, it, it makes for a less efficient warp engine, but it makes for a, a more protected uh, part of the ship. Mm -hmm. So my imagination has the Bizarre collectors blowing, glowing bright red underneath those domes, but where they're covered with some sort of armor material that would perhaps like some futuristic material like one way permeability that lets you know uh deuterium in but not you know phaser fire or something like that i mean just straight away this, this bridge module i mean we know that exactly the size of the x1 bridge and you've really beefed up that bridge module you take the detail down but it's a bigger mm -hmm. dome much more tos but does that mean a bigger room does that mean more operations does that mean more tos styling um, yes, um, I am <laughs> simple answer. Yeah. There you go. I actually imagine I actually have a bridge that I've been working on. It's not ready to show, um, but I also contacted Tommy Craft again for his very highly detailed TOS and um, TOS uh, ENT bridge, and um, I used that as a base. And I actually made it very much more like TOS using mm. the same. Like I rearranged it. Mm. It's actually the bridge itself is smaller, but the bridge complex is much larger there's more space all the way around the bridge, which mm. is still under the bridge dome. So that whole bridge dome is the command center, but like the center of it is like what we understand as the bridge, which looks much more like a TOS bridge. And then, you know, wider command operations all the way around. 
and then it goes back deeper as well there's like a huge communication suite uh back mm. behind the bridge mm. um because i've i've taken that spine that comes out of the bridge like all the way back to the back of the ship and there's mm. there's stuff all the way back there mm-hmm. uh one thing i've actually noticed looking at this here um you kind of got rid of the warp field stabilizer or almost like oh, it looks like the impulse crystal from like the refit um would that have moved somewhere else or was that just not necessary with the new new technology for the warp engines or the the way i looked at the field stabilizer was it was always i mean this is head cannon but always a redundant piece of technology that like the nx class they they weren't really sure like what the prolonged of effect of long distance warp travel would have on like field stability like what if three or four of the coils in one engine were a little more worn out than two or three of the coils in the other engine we need some kind of some kind of technology that can balance the 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 output of both engines that sort of thing (laughs) and my idea is that sort of technology would become either more integrated or obsolete Mm -hmm. so like oh well the the warp engines already do that like we we came up with a new a new conduit that automatically mechanically balances yeah, the warp yeah. the warp well, output rather than far like, longer so straight away better use of space is just make the engines longer lose that extra target an extra thing that can go wrong all right uh so the next question as a designer how do you go about changing or improving a pre-existing design while you still stay true to the original look and feel like how hard a process is that it's not i mean for me it's very freehand like I looked at those catamaran hulls and I'm like, well, I'll just like, there's a curve to the front end and then it becomes all like weird at the back. So I'm like, well, I'll just continue that curve, you know, and see yeah, what yeah. it looks like. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't look so great and sometimes it does. So like the catamaran hulls actually went through like quite a bit of tweaking, but there wasn't a lot of planning. You can't, you can't just stick on stuff to a, to an existing design. Like um, it, it, it it needs to feel logical, right? So, like, I yeah. rearranged some things, like the phase cannons are in different places on this one, and, and um, I added, you know, some, like, I, I extended that spine that goes all the way to the back where that control booth is. Mm-hmm. But, like, I felt that those were changes that, that felt like that's what was intended. Like, it wasn't like, well, we just slapped that on uh, just to change the ship. Yeah, just like a natural prog- progression of design and technology. Oh, it needed to feel authentic, right? So as we know, the one only Doug Drexler, the designer of the original NX-1, also designed the NX refit, the step in between the NX class and the Constitution class. Considering this refit makes the most of the existing class NX, but given the extra upgraded punch, um, do you see any of these designs existing within your Trek timeline? If not, why? Uh, and if so, then why do you think so many NX classes were not simply retrofitted, in, or why do you think they were retrofitted without the secondary hull? I love that refit. It, it looks very nice. But the secondary hull seems like too soon for me. Um, something I really appreciate about the NX class was like, it's just a saucer basically. Um, and I think that that makes a lot of sense for early Starfleet ships. The NX refit is so close to the Constitution class that like you, you wonder why there's a hundred years in between those things. Like, it's virtually a constitution class. You know, the saucer is already the diameter of a constitution class. And then you get a constitution class. It's just the NX refit with a bigger secondary hall and like smooth lines. And mm-hmm. it just seems so soon. Um, I would prefer that the refit didn't happen. Um, I would rather see that happen as a new ship later, closer to the, uh, the original series. And that's sort of what I did with my Pacific where the secondary hull is really minimal and not much to speak of. Like, it's just a deflector and a shuttle bay. It's not even, they haven't even considered using it as a, the warp core, you know? Because um, I had the idea that, like, well, it's not until later that they started to work on that, and then, like, you finally get to the Constitution class. So my idea was if there, I mean, I'm not going to discredit the existence of the Drexel or refit, but I would say it would be something that they didn't do to most of the ships. Uh, it's it's a costly it's a costly mm-hmm. refit. It, it, it's, it'd be almost as, as much cost as just making a new ship, which mm-hmm. might be more reliable, 
my idea was that it's if it's done, it's very rare, and maybe only like one or two of the NX ships would actually have that secondary hull. And then it's like, well, it's problematic, and we don't really, you know, we're not going to invest in these ships. So let's design a whole new ship called the Constitution class to f solve the problem. <laughs> Uh, so one change that I immediately noticed when I saw this was the thickening of the nacelle struts. Now, do you think this was because the ship had upgraded warp nacelles requiring bigger power feeds? And just how fast do you imagine this, your version, going in the universe? you think this is one of the first Warp 7 beauties that they were referring to at the end of These Are the Voyages? I hadn't actually considered that. Um, I actually imagine that this would be slower than, like, the Enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. the, the thicker struts is more is more of an armor kind of thing. Okay, okay. Um, you don't want a beyond situation happening um, uh, to this. Cause that would be, if you lose warp drive in a combat situation, you're dead. Everyone is dead. Um, and the, the Romulans of this era, at least are not taking prisoners. So you don't want to lose warp under any circumstances. So yeah, yeah. the bulked up struts was, was mostly an armor thing for me. And I imagined, you know, these, nacelles that everything is kind of closed up and armored are not operating at full efficiency so hmm. they're 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 more reliable my guess from what you're saying is that they're like third gen warp 5 engine which is obviously now the standard to get to like warp 5 5 and then get to 5 5 no shaking at all because it doesn't need that the, the the two warp 7 engines they have because that really is pushing the boundaries but it's just the third gen completely reliable 5 5 can probably push to 6 if you need it, but then it's going to shake dramatically, sort of thing. So one thing that's immediately noticeable on this is, or not noticeable, I guess, is lack of deflector dish. So is this even a warp-capable vessel? We hear this all the time at Trek Yards. The Miranda can't go to warp. Very weird that the Miranda class would have warp nacelles uh, if it couldn't go to warp. Or the Oberth class, or the Dalas class, as it appears in canon. Or the Franklin, um, or the... Or the warp delta or the mm -hmm. emmet um I, I i know i i i just ha i just had to ask because you know what we get that question all the time at trek yards and it gets very frustrating it, for me it's an in joke because it obviously can but can it eric how can it still go to warp without a deflector dish yes well the deflector dish is safe and sound in there um it's just armored um <laughs> if you look at the the nose uh there are three holes in the front, hmm. which are actually, um, if you pull those off, and maybe I'll give you guys a render of this so you can hmm. maybe show it. If you pull off those panels, there are actually three small deflector dishes inside oh. the, the, behind those three holes. Um, and those, those three holes are, of course, a reference to the TOS Constitution that has, hmm. like, three dots on the front, which people theorize about. And I'm like, well... Maybe it's some kind of backup deflector dish or something like that, which has its origins here. Uh, hmm. So it's there. Um, and there are some semi-transparent panels that are like glowing. You can see the, and there's lots of machinery back there. Um, so it's a very different assembly than the original NX has, hmm. but it, there are definitely, there's definitely a deflector array back there. So it's definitely warp capable. Oh, it's definitely well. <laughs> what other upgrades do you see this ship having specifically over other NX classes or of, of, of what we know from the NX era? Any different weapons, actual shields and such? Any any major leaps? Yeah, I, I played with the idea of shields. I don't I don't think that shields would have been employed when this ship was made. But the ship as we see it in Pacific 201 might also have additional upgrades that did not exist um, you know, post Romulan War or immediately after the war. So, as it appears in, in Pacific 201, it might have some shielding ca capacity, but I do sort of reimagine how shields look on the ships. Um, so, the Pacific actually has like a series of ring like structures on it that are all shield emitters um, that, like, I imagine they kind of create bubbles between each ring. So you have like a ring up here and a ring down here. And if you were to see a shield diagram, it's not a big bubble. It'd be like mm. a series of like, you sense. know, little bubbles. Um, and like this ship doesn't have any of those details that I put on the, the Pacific. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to bank on it having shields. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not a super 
well-armed ship. I kind of imagine there are four on the, uh, the they're phasers now. We call them phasers. Um, there are four hatches on the top that are kind of behind the, or inner inwards from the RCS thrusters. So if you look at that diagram, you see these little like square things. Hmm. Those are actually the phasers and they recess. Hmm. They're all facing I don't know why the back ones are facing forward, but they're all facing forward. So that's why they're like, they're at 45 degree angles from the RCS thrusters. And there would be complementary ones on the bottom as well. So it has eight, it has eight phaser turrets, which would be like nothing compared to the, uh, the Pacific's phaser turrets, which are these huge ball turrets as, as, as in terms of output. And it also has uh, photon torpedoes. Um, the whole armory section has been rearranged in such a way that it's not, um, it's much more centralized. It's not like two separate rooms, how it is on the um, original NX class. It's very much like how we see the photon, uh, the photon bay on the refit constitution class. So uh, almost last question here. How long did you see the NX or your NX variant stay in active service? Was it all open to the original series? Could you see her being flanked by a few constitutions on a mission? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm imagining that they're, they are really kind of wearing out their usefulness by the time the Pacific is launched in 2200. Um, maybe not decommissioned, but like they are becoming more obsolete. So with the, the new brand of Starship, the 200 series Starship that the Pacific is, it does everything that Starfleet could hope for. It's it's the all-in-one package for the first time in a long time. I, I know that real-world militaries will sell old military technology to, to private people that are like, well, I need a ship for this or that, or, you know, mm-hmm. we need apartments that orbit, you know, Vega Colony or whatever. Something like that. Um, I'm sure maybe some of the NX classes would remain in Starfleet service, or they would be the whatever, whatever the... Antar- I think it's the Antares from um, TOS where the the Charlie stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> like whatever they are just, I just don't imagine them just being just scrapped all together like they, mm-hmm. they, they, you might see NX classes here and there like well that's an old ship mm-hmm. but like yeah. they wouldn't be flying around on like export missions well that kind of leads in perfectly to my last question yes. um, is the legacy of the Enterprise still around in your timeline was the original NX-01 decommissioned or refitted by the time of Pacific 201? Is there even a ship named Enterprise flying around at the moment? <laughs> or is there a massive gap until the Constitution Enterprise is launched? They say decommissioned, so... I kind of imagine a massive gap. Firstly, we know that uh, in some way, objectively, that Kirk's Enterprise is the first Federation Enterprise mm-hmm. as understood by the rest of canon. Mm. Um, like, the there have been five Federation ships with that name or whatever, mm. or whatever. Um, so we know that the NX-01 was not considered a Federation Enterprise. Yeah. And there was no Federation Enterprise between the NX-01 and Kirk's ship. So there is definitely a very long pause of Enterprises. But how long was the NX Enterprise around is the question. Yeah. So I kind of imagine that the enterprise exists, but it's like, it's very indicative. It's, it's irreparably attached to the old understanding of Starfleet where unfortunately it was this, it was like kind of the original Starfleet ship exploring and, you know, diplomatic Mm -hmm. relations. But after the war, Starfleet has this very Navy connotation in, in my interpretation where Starfleet exists as a military organization pr- protecting Earth and its colonies and whatever. There's no larger Federation Starfleet. It's still very, you know, people are, the, the Federation is still getting used to working together. Um, and there's just not, like, the Enterprise would not be, like, this, like, glorious, gleaming, maybe, like, well, it was a ship that fought in the war, and it was the flagship back then, but, like... So maybe it's the it's, Galactica. It has a museum in it now, and it's just flying around, sort of doing its thing, but really not. It's an important ship, but it's oh. not like this huge, like, yeah, yes, that's the Enterprise, right? So in my in my interpretation, the Pacific is kind of the new, like, that's where it's at kind of ship. Like, this is the new beginning for Starfleet. It's the Pacific. 
See, that's what I love about Trek Yards. We ask, especially with you, we ask you questions. You're like, I never really thought about that. And then you go into this whole explanation of how it could fit in. And I love that. I think it's great. Anyway, I think that's it for today, guys. We'll, we'll call we'll call it we'll call it done. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for joining us uh, yet again for another episode of Trek Yards. Yes, thanks, Eric. We always love listening to all your thoughts that you put into your designs. There's a lot of attention to detail there that I know I and a lot of other people or fans really appreciate. So thank you very much for all you all that you do. So until next time, guys, don't forget about our Patreon as well as uh, if you want to continue seeing great Trek Kills on a weekly basis, monthly basis, all that jazz. Every bit you can give will help support us. Or simply visit trekkills.com and click the donate button if you want also. And also, as always, please like this video, subscribe to the channel so that you can see all of our content as it comes hot off the presses, so to speak. And also, please share this and any other of our videos as that helps get the name of Trek Yards out there. And Pacific 201, sorry. Yeah. Well, until, <laughs> now, until next time, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Gordon Coggins. And I'm Eric. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>